morning everyone at least everyone who's here on time there's quite a few of you um welcome to our uh, i can't remember which day we're on fourth day of the uh, gfe conference was it the fifth um anyway and this here from uh, hersley um to give us an overview on uh, zos connect um enterprise edition so without further ado tony if you want to take it away cheers Thanks very much. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Anthony Papagiorgio. I'm the offering manager for API enablement on IBM Z. Um, so that means that I deal with a lot of strategy around integration with, with APIs as a whole, but primarily focused on uh, the, the ZOS Connect product and, and the business around it. Um, so today uh, we have quite a packed session. So I only had one session as I had three ideas of what I wanted to do at this conference. Um, so I've gone for three and one. So you kind of got three almost 20 minute talks um, in, in one session. So hopefully that should keep it fresh and, and interesting and uh, shouldn't drag too much. Um, so we have uh, first off a, a product update. So I'll do a quick recap on ZOS Connect and what it is and what our mission is, just for those if anyone's unaware. Um, and then an update on our um, new capabilities that we've delivered through um, through 2020. Um, and then we'll go on to uh, a little bit more, not really deep technical, but just some sort of tips and really just pointers to a lot of good information um, that you can use uh, when you're sort of going from like, okay, I've done my first project or I, I've tried out my first API. How do I move this and, and scale it out to uh, production, what are the things I should be thinking about? Um, and then finally, we'll finish off with some, uh, some examples, uh, some use cases, some of the stories from our customers, how they've been using the product, hopefully get the, uh, the wheels turning and get you thinking about how you might apply this. Might give you some tips as well on how, you know, if you're trying to, uh, you know, advocate for doing this in your business, you don't quite know how to approach it and trying to think about how to articulate the benefits, um, that, that'll be some really good stuff in there for you as well. Um, so first up, product update. What is Zealous Connect and what's new this year? Um, so really the challenge that we were faced um, back in sort of 2015, 2016 uh, was this, and that was that modern developers were demanding API access to core enterprise systems, and yet companies were struggling to provide that access um, to their business services that were on um, IBM Z. Uh, the, the phrase that I used a lot of the time was that um, developers are your new customers and APIs are new, your new products. Um, developers start to have a lot of power in that, you know, if they, if, that they want to move very quickly. They want things that facilitate uh, what they're trying to build and allow them to do things intuitively and quickly. And if they can't do that with a system, they tend to just quickly grab some data and spin off a database in a, you know, on a distributed side or on the cloud and just say, I'm going to interact with this because I don't want to go to the core thing. Um, and that can become a bit of a nightmare from an enterprise architect's um, perspective. So, um, so API is a really good way to sort of reuse those core business services and, you know, allow the developers in your organization and uh, indeed other organizations, if you want to make them public, um, to sort of get on and, do what they have to do. Um, so the solution that we came up with was, was ZOS Connect. We did look across the platform at the time. We said, okay, there's a number of ways of getting into the various subsystems, but really what, um, what we needed was a single way of doing this across uh, the entire platform. Um, so you saw how a single place to manage this, you could get your seamless open API access to all of your subsystems uh, in one way, um, obviously, leveraging the security that we have on Z and with all the qualities of service, the qualities of service that you expect from the platform. Um, and that, that's really what it is, APIs to the platform. We also allow programs on the platform to call out to APIs. So if you're in a COBOL program and you want to call an API, not the most intuitive thing to do from COBOL or PL1, uh, but we make that a bit more straightforward for you. Um, so if you want to try that out, uh, we have um, a Z trial, which is a cloud-based trial. You just click there, sign up, 20 minutes, they'll deploy you an environment and you can have a go. It's just some like 30 minute sort of mini labs that just take you through, you know, creating a, an API and, 
or, or um, doing a few things. So um, you can try that out, the link there. Um, so we're not just about um, the things that we do out the box. We're actually uh, part of the key design point of the product was to have um, a, a sort of open and extensible interface. Um, you know, we said we want to cover everything on Z, and that's not just um, our stuff. That's that, that, that's sort of anyone else's stuff as well. Um, so th this is an extensible interface. It keeps getting added to, um, and with third-party integrations, you can API enable sort of more and more things. And the big one fairly recently that you might not know about is um, we partnered with DXC and uh, to, to provide some adapters for their Hogan core banking platform. So if you're a Hogan user, um, there's like, likely a route there. If you talk to D DXC, they have a, an adapter for Hogan and then they provide a bunch of services uh, for ZOS Connect that's sort of pre-done for you. And then they're sort of ready to map those into into APIs. Um, so really the benefits of this, as I said, you can unlock Z stuff and expose it uh, with intuitive API interfaces. You can call APIs from Z apps. You can expand what you're doing with your Z applications, integrate them with other parts of the business. Um, and the idea is that you can do all of this in, in minutes. Um, so you can rapidly respond to your business. Um, you can reduce your overall development costs uh, for API enabling the platform. And, you know, we always say it's quick and easy, it's secure and scalable, and it's a single um, technology to manage and control your API access to and from the platform. So dig, in those, dig into those a little bit. Um, when we say quick and easy, uh, certainly for API provider, there's no code involved. It's all point and click interfaces. It's an Eclipse-based tool. Um, you know, it's very straightforward to um, import a copybook and map that into an API. Um, API requester, obviously you're going to have to make some modifications to your COBOL program, but it's very uh, similar to what you might expect with something like Swagger code gen. You, you, you build um, some native interfaces out of the Swagger doc and, um, and, and you then use those in, in the program. Um, so it's, it's uh, very sort of quick and easy to get on with. Um, secure and scalable. So we have an interesting job to do uh, bringing APIs to the platform in sort of marrying the two uh, different security domains. So you have the sort of distributed domain, typically to talking in things like um, JWT or, or JOT tokens, depending where you are in the world and how, how you like to pronounce that. Um, and, and sort of bringing that into a Z security context, often protected by, um, you know, protected by SAF, usually RACF. Um, and uh, making sure that we can sort of do that transformation between those two worlds uh, for you. Um, and obviously being able to do this at a scale that is suitable uh, for enterprises. I'll get a bit more onto scale a bit later on. Um, finally, managing control. Um, so the nice thing about Zodos Connect is a single technology that you're doing this um, across all of your subsystems. So you're not um, sort of doing APIs one way for kicks and a different way for IMS and then a different way for DB2 and having to sort of monitor and manage this in different ways and integrate with various tools and different formats of SMF, SMF records. The single way of doing this, we cut SMF records, but uh, records for every single request that goes through the system. And um, it, we can uh, also have hook points for integration with various monitoring tools. And we look at both traditional monitoring on the platform, but also with APIs, you sort of have to have a one eye looking outwards and say, well, there are other monitoring solutions that people are likely using across the business to do end-to-end -end transaction monitoring across, uh, you know, from mobile device to back end. And how do we integrate with that, those as well? Things like App Dynamics and Splunk come up a lot in that space. Uh, we can absolutely get our data there um, and you get these sort of nice views that you see there. Um, and that's really it. Like, it's a very straightforward product. We do two primary things, APIs in, APIs out. And as I said, secure scale and, and sort of qualities of service that you expect from Z. Now, the way that we've delivered this is um, sort of at the time was relatively unique. I think there's a number of other Z products that sort of following in our footsteps. Uh, but we're, you know, we fully embrace continuous delivery to allow us to really respond to what was quite a changing and dynamic 
marketplace at the time when we sort of came to market we said well you know you guys are still learning what you want to do with this technology and we've got to be able to respond so made the choice to say well we're gonna release um on a on a uh, every every month so a monthly um continuous delivery drop and offset by two weeks from that we actually drop an open beta so we're actually shipping something every roughly two weeks um so there's a lot going on and that's what i'd like to sort of cover today because even if you heard about zos connect last year there's there's been a lot that we've done in, in the meantime so this is what 2020 looked like for us um uh pandemic's obviously been very interesting a lot of change you know development teams working from home uh, anyone who's into software development knows that it's a it's a team sport requires a lot of uh, a lot of communication uh, so uh, this, this did have its challenges but I, you know the team has done extremely well uh, to really not miss a beat and you know keep delivering new capabilities and value um, across the year um, so I'm just going to dig into a few of these on the next slide um, but as I said, there's a lot of things coming in. They tend to be quite small pieces of value. So each one's quite easy to sort of get your head around and go, okay, that's what that is, that's what that is. But if you if you don't sort of look at it for a period of time, it's like, whoa, okay, a lot's a lot's changed. Um, but it is incremental. It's not like we we break or change anything that's that's gone before. Um, apart from that cause thing, that was a um, that was been prepping people for a while to say at some point you're going to have to make sure you configure calls properly um and that was a change that came in liberty anyway so uh first up big one kicked off the year with uh db2 service creation and um so for those of you familiar with the product uh so whilst we always had kicks ims db2 and mq from the outset um our Eclipse tooling only facilitated the creation of services for Kix and IMS, and you had to use a command line tool for DB2 and MQ. So that was one of the big things we wanted to change this year. So uh, we bought well DB2, MQ, and we've introduced IMS DB as well. So you can now create service projects for uh, these types of assets on Z. Um, and this is really, really nice. So you, when you're creating your project, say, okay, it's a DB2 project, you can connect to your um, to your DB2 instance, and it can query all of the, um, the, the services that have been made available in DB2. So you can sort of search them and you get a list and you go, okay, it's this particular uh, query uh, or store procedure that the, um, uh, the, the admins have made available to us. Uh, and you can sort of use that space and it will import all the schemas and it kind of does all that stuff for you. So it massively streamlines this uh, this creation, uh, which is really, really good. Um, next up, another database. Um, so IMSDB uh, works slightly differently. So I don't have that facility for publishing, um, I guess, a curated set of, of um, uh, queries and stored procedures. So this is... Um, much more based on, okay, give me the SQL command, we'll extract the, the variables that are in that from a, uh, for, for an input interface, and we'll query the database and say, well, what's the, uh, what, what's the schema that we're gonna get back for the, for the columns, the result of this query, and then um, and we can package that up into a response interface, interface for you. Um, so another, uh, you know, really, really good example a lot of people have been sort of looking at this saying well you know one of the main reasons i was going to imstm was just to read data and i'd like to you know short cut that across straight to db so um that was a really nice one to add um final one mq um again a few variations there um you know if you just want the sort of fire and forget for sending messages or for picking messages off queue we have that if you want to send a message in and wait for a response on a on a second queue you can do that as well um, but again just you know in the interface configuring what you would have had to do um, normally in the, the server xml or through uh, command line tool so um, again simplifying what uh, what we have to do this also uses the same copybook import and editing technology that we had um in, in for, for kicks and ims so 
Um, you'll see a lot of familiarity with, with that. Um, people are using that already. Um, so another big one, uh, Open API 2 compliant dates. So if anyone's familiar with the Open API spec, uh, one of the data types that they have is a date type or a date format even uh, spec'd out by an RFC. And it's fairly straightforward. It's four digit year, dash two digit month, dash two digit, digit day. And of course, we all know this is exactly how dates are stored everywhere on, on the mainframe and you know indeed the last you know 20 30 years of of date formats and um no they're obviously not um so in in, in COBOL programs and pl1 programs you typically typically get things like this which are interesting where they say okay i've got um seven digits the first four are the year and then the next three are the number the the day of the year and now I need to convert that into a date. So we, we now have the ability to flag fields as, okay, this is a date field. And you get to tell us the pattern um, that, that this field um, is, is stored in. And we will then extract the information of year or, or uh, year, date, and month, and we'll sort of work that out. And we will give you a proper formatted Open API 2 uh, date field. So we'll give you something that looks like this from a field that looks like this. Now you're probably looking at saying, "Oh, well, that that was a that was a bit easy." Uh, what about when I have uh, display dates that have slashes or characters? Is that well, okay? We can do that as well. So you can just give us a um, host pattern that you know if you've got something here that's stored in day, month, year with slashes in between, you can tell us that pattern, um, and we'll we'll again format that out in the standard way. Um, if you've got something that's really crazy and it's actually a sort of compound structure, uh, you can give us the high level um, field and you say, okay, there's a bunch of stuff under this. This is what it basically looks like when, um, you know, sort of the, the filler fields and, and stuff. And we'll take that and again, we'll extract the data out for it. So it's a very, very flexible thing. I, when we started this, this was sort of, oh, how hard can this be? Um, and actually, and we were sort of hoping that you know, whilst there were probably a lot of ways you could store dates, most people would have done it in the same way. And actually our design partnership uh, were really helpful in, in showing us all of the weird and wonderful ways that people do this. Um, so we, we have built something here, which uh, is, is extremely flexible and hopefully can deal with uh, any um, strange sort of date formats that you, you want to throw at it. Um, it's really, really good. Um, final one, uh, I know we're in the kicks track, so I thought I'd focus on this one. Um, so API requester, um, for those of you who are not familiar with the way this um, used to work in kicks, you'd say it effectively have a configuration in the kicks region and the, our communication stub that you install in there, and you'd, you'd give it a URI map for the ZOS Connect server that you want to call out to from this kicks region. The idea being that any application on that region, you know, you're going out to ZOS Connect, you'd have all the APIs that you want to have, you know, for outbound connections in that ZOS Connect um, server, what, what more could you possibly need? Well, turns out a lot of people said, well, I have reasons why I want to se segregate these. I have different people looking after different sets of APIs. Maybe I want a set of APIs that are internal to the company. Maybe I want some that are external. I want different security, different permissions. Um, those kind of things. And really, I need the applications to decide um, which server they need to go to for any given API call. Um, so we now have the ability on, on those API calls to specify. So you can specify multiple multiple URI maps for different ZOS Connect servers. And then you have the ability on the call to override the default configuration in the communication stub. So you say, actually, for this call, I want to go out to this server. Um, and go this way. So um, nice little addition. It really helps um, as we've started to get into large scale production topologies where people say, okay, I've got like 50, 100 teams using this. I need to do some isolation segregation. Um, and, and this is the sort of stuff that, that really, really helps that. Um, you notice as we go along, there's been links at the bottom here. Um, if you download the slides, they're all you know, linkable in the PDF. So you can click on those. 
big theme of this presentation is sort of light touch on the information, but you've got a lot of links if you want to dig into anything that you uh, find really interesting. So that is a brief uh, summary of uh, kind of where we are and what we've been up to uh, this year. Uh, I've touched on the things here with the, the magnifying glass. There's obviously a lot more uh, that you can go and look into um, if you look at the, the change history in our knowledge center. Um, but that is it for the first 20 minutes of the session. Um, any questions at that point? Um, or any just indication that people are alive and enjoying it so far? And I'm not just talking to the ether. <laughs> you can post something in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, if anyone's got any questions, please pop them on the chat. Here we go. Ah, would you extend the URI map to su uh, support to batch? As in, uh, ah, okay. Um, yes, so so this is interesting. So this um, was actually a capability that you kind of had already uh, in uh, the sort of the batch and the IMS case because of the way that the um, because of the way that the com stub was configured um, and because it uses web toolkit, you could do this already. And actually, bizarrely, this was a limitation of kicks that was uh, really a manifestation of something we, we did to sort of simplify the configuration and say, oh, well, kicks has a great way of defining um, you know, URIs and um, TCR, TCP IP endpoints. So we'll use that. And we ended up with this situation where you define it once for the region and everyone sort of got channeled through that. And uh, then we sort of realized that ah, actually people want to pick. Um, so you can already do this for, uh, for batch and IMS um, when going outbound, uh, but it works slightly differently. It's not your IMAPs because that's a kicks thing. But okay, perfect. Good question though, thank you. Um, keep me honest. So uh, moving on. Uh, POC to production. So some tips uh, on, on some things to think about when moving from your first project uh, over to sort of production rollout instead of connect. Uh, so as I said, this is going to be fairly sort of light touch uh, on, on the technicals, but there are some amazing resources that have been created around this. Um, and I really encourage you to the, the links that are on this, download the presentation, follow the links. Um, and, and that will sort of give you all the information around sort of how to configure and, and set things up. Um, so first one, connections. So it, it's been a really interesting few years. I had the privilege of working on some amazing projects with companies all over the world. And this is probably my number one. I can, you know, if I could go back and say we needed to think about a piece of this, uh, the design of this product a little bit harder, it would have been around the way we did connection references or at least communicating better on, on how to do this um, in, in a good way. So there's nothing inherently wrong about the way the product works. I think it's just an assumption people make or just the, the route people go through and you just see this over and over again. And it's not a hard thing to fix, but and as soon as you say it to someone, you go, oh, I should have done that from the beginning. Um, but yeah, think carefully about connection reference names. now. If you're uninitiated, you're probably sat there saying, what's a connection reference? Well, um, our basic architecture of how a, an API uh, provider is uh, constructed in ZOS Connect has three main components. So you have the API, describes all the, the paths and the URLs and, and those sorts of things. You then have services, which detail the underlying Z assets. So sort of, these are the requests and response copybooks. This is the program. Um, you know, and the API will say, I use this service when you do a get to slash items or something, right? You have lots of services uh, backending the single API. Um, and then you have a service provider or, or a, a, a sort of a connection factory in the, in the server XML. And that defines a connection for, you know, this environment for this server to the, um, to, to the region. And the design point was really not to have environmental stuff in, in these two assets so that they can move between environments without having to change too much. So it's like, well, you know, the program's going to be called this whatever environment, you know, uh, what I shouldn't do is be putting uh, kind of IP addresses of Kix regions in here. So all of that kind of got put in 
um, in, in our connection definition. But obviously, you do need to have one affinity here. You need a reference. You need something that's going to tell the service, well, you know, what, what am I what am I meant to connect to? So you need to name this guy and he references him by name. And what that means is, so you have this connection reference. And, you know, in a, in a real life example, uh, or well, it's actually a demo example, but, you know, things end up looking a bit like this. So you've got um, a, a, an API, got a bunch of services. In this case, these services actually call the same program in a different way. But, um, but the point is these services uh, all want to, you know, use this use this connection. So what we wouldn't want to do is have this connection defined in each of these services. So that's why we sort of broke it out. But what it requires you to do is name this reference. And I don't think we really realized how important your naming strategy for these references was and the implications it can have. So this is what people do when they're in POC. They get really excited and they say, ah, I'm in development. I've got to define a connection to my dev, my dev region. Uh, we'll just call it dev kicks. Great. Let's get cracking. They create a bunch of services. They're all referencing dev kicks. Fantastic. And then they say, OK, I need to set up a test server. Um, OK, so the guys who set that up just go, OK, this is just going to be test kicks one, test kicks two. And then the guys who set up the prod server are going to do like prod kicks. And that's fine. Now, you notice the flaw in this plan is that these services now are not portable between environments because they are expecting um, they're expecting dev kicks to be defined in each of these environments. Okay, um, so th this is where you get into difficulties. I see a lot of people overcomplicating things here, where they'll start saying, "Okay, well, what I'm going to do is have some automation that edits that service project and then rebuilds it for each environment." with a new service name, or they might say, I'm gonna use policy where I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna say that everything must be, have prod kicks baked into the service, but then I'm gonna use policy so that people can use headers in dev and test to override that connection. It's really overcomplicating the issue. All you need to do is think about naming these things logically, even if it means doing a little bit more XML than you maybe thought you should be doing and maybe duplicating some of those connections in certain environments. So for an example here, let's just say that in production, our mortgages application, our loans application, and our credit card application reside on different kicks regions. That means that I should have three logical connections because they're gonna to have to be separate connections when they hit production. Now, even if in development, all of those applications were maybe deployed on the same kicks region, because that's how we do things, um, I still want to define those names logically. And then what happens is I create my services and then when I move them to test where maybe I have some, you know, a different region set up, maybe loans and credits sit on the same kits region, fine. But I've still got those same three connections. They just point to different places and you're abstracting away the underlying topology from what you're doing in the service archive. Um, and then finally, when you get to production, everything sort of flows through. So hopefully that, makes sense. Uh, but that's sort of my number one. <laughs> so when you're thinking about your infrastructure and your connections, it's, off, it's, a, it's a small detail, it's often overlooked. Um, but I see so many times people make things a lot more complicated than they have to just because they haven't thought about that naming strategy for, um, for their connection references. Um, we do have a small piece in the KC about doing this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's often overlooked. So you know, apologies, we will do better on future designs, but um, and I think we've learned a lot from what we've seen. Uh, but it's, it's not too hard to solve, as you can see, it's fairly straightforward to think about. It just requires a little bit of thought and a little bit of um, foresight. Um, uh, so a question on the chat. We use a routing policy for connection names, uh, which has details set in the HTTP header. Yep, so as I said, that's what, um, that's what a lot of people do uh, to, to solve this issue. Um, it's perfectly valid. You know, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. I, I personally think it's, you know, kind of overcomplicates it, but yet there are, um, there are definitely reasons to use policy to do that. Um, especially when you want to do something a bit more dynamic where you say, actually, I don't want, you know, the, you know, perhaps the, the way I work in test is, 
um, you know, it's not hard and fast rules here. Maybe I can run the mortgages one on the test region two, and it depends what, you know, on, I've got a test run where I've installed a new version of the mortgages thing on that region. I need the test to go there so I can use a header to, to do that. So there are reasons to do that. Um, but yeah, in general, um, you know, you can, you can do this um, without um, too much use of, of policy. But if you want to do something dynamic, then that's what policy is there for. Um, so really good stuff. Hope that answers the question, Sean. I'll assume so. Oh, maybe he's typing. Yes, perfect. All right, good stuff. All right, tip two, um, DevOps. So, um, Zelos Connect is designed for modern DevOps, and you know, well, of course, it's a new product. Um, but what what does this really mean? Well, the, the fact is that because we're designed for modern DevOps, if you try to treat it in the same way that you might work with um, your more traditional ZOS um, resources, it doesn't, um, it, it, you know, you, it's not that you can't do it. It's just, again, makes things a little bit more, it makes things more difficult for yourself than you really, um, really need them to be. Um, so really this is, you know, a very standard DevOps uh, model. You put source into source code management, uh, you have build automation that extracts that source and builds it into deployable assets. You deploy those assets to um, environments to test and then later on to uh, release. Uh, we have a command line tool, build toolkit that will take as input a service, you know, take as input um, our, our source files, our projects, and it will produce as output these deployable artifacts. Um, so, you know, it, it sort of at this stage, this shouldn't feel too unfamiliar. Uh, it, you do sometimes see people saying, I'm sort of going to use the server almost as the source of the source. And it's like, no, the thing in the server is like compiled artifacts. You've got to keep the, you know, you, you need to keep the source sort of nicely controlled um, separately. You need to be using a, a build process. So just if you're thinking about it in this way and how that's going to fit into your <clears throat> development processes, then you start to have really good synergy with all of the, the sort of tools and capabilities that, um, that the product has to help facilitate this rather than sort of fighting um, at every stage the, the way that uh, the product wants you to work. So. Um, so first thing, you know, expanding this out of how this would look across a few environments. So in development, um, you have developers using our Eclipse tool, API toolkit. They have facility in there. They can click a project and say deploy to server. It's great for development. That's not how you should be doing things in, in production or um, in, in even sort of, sort of QA and, and test, right? You, you want to be using automation to drive that. Uh, but really, really good for developers, just quick iter iteration. Um, you move your source through uh, streams in source code management. You, hey, okay, I've promoted that into, committed that into, uh, in, into test. And um, now you want build automation that's going to build this and store those artifacts in uh, some kind of artifact repository. Um, and then you want some kind of deployment orchestration. It could be you know, something as simple as a, you know, a rec script or, you know, or it could be something quite sophisticated, depending if you're, you want to coordinate some deployment of this plus a bunch of other assets in front and behind across different systems. So people go, you know, can go kind of crazy with deployment automation. But the point is, um, we have two main ways of um, getting things and interact into servers and interacting with servers. So we have a REST admin API if you want to interact with live servers. And we also have, um, what we call auto deploy, which is just uh, you can put files into this directly into the server directory. So the automation is no more complicated than a file copy and then a, a modify command to hit the server and say, you know, uh, pick that up. If, if you haven't configured the the auto, it auto deploy sort of continuously, you know, every so often will pull that folder and sort of pick it up. Um, it's pretty good for development, um, not so great um, for test automation when you want to know exactly when it's picked it up. So normally automation script would go copy file in, kick the server to pick it up, run a test and then 
um, that can remove it. Um, and then once you get into production, uh, some people build again, uh, some people, because they like that sort of single, I know exactly what's in production because I built it from the stream. So if we ever need to sort of panic edit it, we can. Um, some people will just say, I like the artifacts that I did QA test on. I'm just going to migrate them to a production artifact repository when I'm happy. And then again, use deployment automation. So we've got um, DevOps guides um, and in, in our KC, there's a link there uh, at the bottom. Um, so just a bit deeper on how some of this uh, ends up looking. So um, using Bon source code repository, something like Git or, or Jazz uh, through RTC, um, it's a really, really good idea here. Uh, just simply because it's just going to be better for dealing with uh, things like Eclipse projects and files. You can say ignore specific files like sort of bin folders and things that you don't want in there. Um, you know, building is very, very straightforward with our build, build toolkit. So Zoscom BT is our, um, is our command line tool. So a, a script to sort of build um, all of the, uh, all of the things here, You're just sort of going, okay, you know, build this, um, this project and then output it into a build folder. So it's like, boom, 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 boom. It's quite straightforward to write a shell script that will, um, you know, you know, iterate through every, um, every you know check out the the source tree iterate through every project and build it and output that into a into a artifact sort of repository which could just be a folder you know or you might use something a bit more sophisticated like um you know jfrog um but you artifact um so you artifact you you build those into artifacts and you then um, you then have them as deployable assets. So th those are the things that you can deploy uh, to your server. Um, so in terms of how that deployment works, um, you, as I said, we have REST admin APIs for the server. So you can do that against live servers. You can copy files across. It's also a very, very popular way of doing it, especially in HA setups, because you can copy the file into the shared server directory and then poke all the running servers and say, pick it up. Um, but you might want to orchestrate this with a wider deployment. So as an example here, that's sort of listening on source code and it's like, okay, I've noticed a change come in source code management. I'm going to check that out. I'm going to build it and then going to check our test server to see if it's already got this service in. If it has, I'm going to stop the service, do an update, start the service and, and finish. If it, if not, I'm just going to deploy it. Um, so it sort of shows you that re really this is sort of just saying the interfaces we have, the REST APIs, uh, the command line tools really facilitate you leaning on um, these, these sort of modern DevOps uh, frameworks and, and automation to sort of help um, the way that you're, you're working, the way that you're managing your, your ZOS Connect deployments. Um, another thing that really helps with this, uh, Zoe, uh, if you're familiar with the Zoe project. So of course our REST API can be surfaced in the Zoe project, but more importantly, we've created a, um, uh, a, a Zoe command line uh, plugin that front ends that API. So effectively you can now script, uh, you know, in a single script, you can do things like, okay, I'm gonna, um, I, you know, I'm gonna use some Git commands to check out some code. I'm gonna use the Zoscom Build, a build toolkit to build that stuff. I'm going to use Zoe to um, copy those files over to the mainframe. I'm going to use Zoe to start a server. And then I'm going to use the Zoe ZosConnect plugin commands to interact with that server so I can start, stop APIs and install things. So um, really, really good stuff there. Um, finally, with testing, um, there's when it comes to testing this stuff, you don't need to look for any mainframe specific stuff. In terms of the front end, it's just a REST API. So anything that is sort of saying we can help you automate REST API testing, um, you, you can absolutely use that with, with ZOS Connect. Um, I actually had one really weird example where people had um, used ZOS Connect solely to front end 
their COBOL programs so that they could test their COBOL programs using modern test tools that want to drive API driven test cases. So they weren't using the APIs in production at all. They're just using it as part of their test framework, which is really interesting just as a kind of use case. Not very usual, but um, was, uh, was pretty interesting. Um, gonna pick up the pace just a little bit. So versioning, um, think about versioning up front um, and acknowledge that it is part of your API design. So um, here's a sort of good example. So, well, first off, API versioning, um, if you do a bit of a search around for how to version APIs, you'll see lots of articles that say five ways to version your APIs and why they're all wrong. Um, so this is not something that I feel the, the industry has fully mastered yet and sort of settled on one way of doing it. Um, but a couple of tips here, versioning your API in the base path, very, very good idea. Versioning your project names, uh, also a very, very good idea. It helps you when bringing in new versions of uh, services and things. Um, but really, the point is that your enterprise will likely have some kind of versioning strategy for how they're approaching APIs, right? Maybe they say, we don't version on the base path, we version on the paths themselves. So it's like item slash V2 to say that I've got the V2 version of the items object, right? Um, <clears throat> but the point is, <clears throat> you, the decisions you make here, if they don't fit with what your wider organization is doing, you are gonna have um, some interesting issues trying to get the two things to, to marry up. So my top suggestion here is go talk to those people, go find out who those people are who are making decisions around API design and go talk to them um, because it's quite difficult to change this uh, later. So think about it up front. Um, security. Um, so security, as, as I said before, we sit in between two different worlds. So there's quite a lot to think about with security, um, but try not to dive in and get overwhelmed by all of the security options. Uh, see quite a lot of people dive in and go, I'm going to try and configure everything. And really, there's a lot of stuff in ZOS Connect um, in terms of different ways to do things. And that's mainly there because we have to support a lot of different use cases and the way that people want to work. It doesn't mean you have to configure you know, every option. Um, so for instance, on an inbound flow, there are things to think about. Okay, I need to think about where credentials are coming from. I need to think about how I'm gonna authenticate those credentials, how I'm gonna map them to a SAF identity, how I'm gonna do my authorization, and what scopes people are gonna be allowed. You know, What do I wanna do for auditing? Uh, how am I going to secure the connection between us and the system of record? And you know, what ID do I eventually want to run under? Is it a static task ID? Is it some kind of inferred ID from, from this? Or do I want to propagate this distributed ID? So there's lots of points to think about. We do lay this out. We've done a lot of work with our security documentation to kind of take you through what the options are at these various stages. Um, and same kind of thing for outbound as well, but it's reversed and you, you sort of get into interesting things of what identity we're using to go and get a token from a token authority and, and use that on the outbound request. Um, you know, tip, just to sort of dive into one of those boxes. So let's think about authentication, right? You might dive into authentication and you see, well, you know, here are just three options. Okay, I could authenticate with basic auth, I could use client certificate, I might use third-party token, like JWT is probably one of the most popular things we see. Um, and then am I gonna authenticate that with, um, you know, with a third party? Am I gonna, uh, you know, and then, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm also gonna look to my user registries, maybe SAF, or I'm gonna have an LDAP or something. So there's a lot of options, okay? And that's really the, the issue is the number of options of things you could do, right? Now, the tip here I'd say is you, you really have two people or two organizations you need to speak to. You need to speak to the mainframe security people and understand what their requirements are. You need to speak to the distributed security people, and understand what their strategy is on how they want to secure APIs. And then what you'll get down to is hopefully you'll at least then know the list of options. You'll sort of say, okay, what I need to do is I need to have, you know, um, connections secured with ATTLS and I'm flowing JWTs that will have a distributed identity based on uh, you know this um, this mapping strategy that we have in RACF. And once you know that, 
then it becomes fairly straightforward to say, here's how I configure those pieces and, and make sure it all ties together. Uh, but if you're just sort of going in blind, trying to make these choices on your own, it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, so yeah, my tip is again, go, go talk to the people. Uh, finally, monitoring. Um, so um, again, we are built to integrate with end-to-end um, -end API monitoring. We did a lot of work last year uh, in introducing new capabilities in this space. Um, and so really it's the sort of look beyond what you traditionally do with, um, with ZOS subsystems uh, into what you, you sort of could be doing uh, to monitor API. So SMF is really good. Um, you know, we'll cut SMF records like this for every request that goes through. You can see a bunch of good information here. Who called it, where did it come from, what they're calling, where did it go to, how long did it spend there, you know, where, you know what time it went there, what time it came back, all this stuff, really, really good stuff. Um, but actually, this is just one example of what's possible from our Inceptor framework. So really, we have an audit Inceptor that comes through the product. And that grabs all that information for every request off our Inceptor framework and outputs SMF 123s. Now we have some people that go operational analytics. I just want the SMF records, you know, pipe them out through common data provider at something like Splunk. Brilliant. Um, if you're into sort of real time monitoring or we're doing things, interesting things with end to end tracking, tracking tokens, um, those sorts of things, you know, very typical with something like app dynamics. Um, you, you want to plug into this in, Incept framework, and it, you know this is this is really vendor space stuff. So it's sort of saying to your vendor that interface is there. Can you you know pick it up and and, and use that information? Um, so a, a few examples. So a bit more traditional real time monitoring with with a Megamon. Really good information here. If you want to see what APIs are being called. How often they're being called, how long, where they're going to, uh, how long they're taking it back at, you know, uh, at the back end, uh, a Megamon. So, sorry, on the previous slide, if you search for ZOS Connect uh, monitoring API workloads, you'll, you should come across uh, this uh, really good blog on our IBM Z and then it's one community. Uh, in that blog, you'll then see links off to other articles. So, monitoring with a Megamon, uh, diagnosis with a Megamon. Also, tomorrow, same time. Uh, Ash is going to be doing a, a really good session on uh, diagnosis using a Megmon and, and looking at APIs and, and subsystems. So end-to-end um, -end tracking, and th this is where it gets a bit more interesting. So if you're just focused on what you can do on the mainframe, that's kind of cool, but you, you sort of miss an opportunity. So um, APIs flow across, um, across your enterprise end-to-end. -end. So people are often very interested in you know, personal mobile device clicks, um, you know, make a payment and, you know, do we understand how long that takes and where we might have issues along the way. So people start to employ these sort of business level dashboards that sort of show, um, you know, interesting sort of topologies across nodes. And until uh, very recently, you typically say, if it goes to the mainframe, you just sort of go to like, a, oh, and then it went to the mainframe. And if that mainframe is slow for some reason, then they just phone up head of mainframe and go mainframe slow. And then they're like, oh, I don't know where it is. What's the request, you know? So the really nice thing is if you come into ZOS Connect, you can at least see that we came into ZOS Connect and ZOS Connect without doing any further inst instrumentation on the platform will tell you what we went to. So we tell you the first half. If you then further in, uh, instrument the other things on the platform with, um, the, sorry, this is uh, ZAPM Connect. So it does this. Uh, data gathering and acts as an agent for um, app dynamics. Uh, you can then see sort of the next top. Oh, you went from this kicks region to to an AOR, to an FOR, to DB2, and back. And then what you, they can see is they go, ah, I have a problem specifically with this FOR kicks region. So they can sort of zero in on the problem uh, and get a uh, get it sorted uh, much more effectively. Um, other reason this is really important is ZOS Connect is the new animal in the zoo. Uh, so typically we get blamed for all of the problems, even when um, it's never really our fault. Um, so being able to prove innocence and have these kind of views that says, uh, it's not us, it's further down the stream or it's in front of us, um, very, very useful. So getting it plugged in um, to these kind of frameworks is really, really good. Um, 
And finally, so operational analytics. Uh, so Splunk can give you some really nice views across um, your, your SMF data to sort of give you tracks of like how many requests, what types of requests and uh, where they're coming from. So um, another example there in that article um, of, of how you can do that. Um, but basically top tip is use the options that are available um, for you to make sure that the people who need visibility on various aspects of how the API is running have that information. Don't sort of just say, oh, well, I'm just looking at it from a mainframe perspective and that's all I need to know. Think about the other people in the business who might be interacting with the API and need to know something. There's absolutely ways to get um, that information out to them uh, in the framework or the tool or the view um, that they want. Um, so use it. Um, okay, that was a real whistle stop tour. And actually, that I probably even had too much in that because it's taken a bit longer than I thought. Uh, but there's so much more to this. And what I, I, that was sort of a few highlights from a much richer guide that IBM Montpellier have released. Um, it covers a bunch more topics and is available at the link there. So ibm.biz slash CCE dash deployment dash guide. Um, Nigel Williams has also done a, a webinar on this topic. Again, it's sort of a cut down version of what's in the, the entire guide, but really, really good information uh, covering a whole load of topics that you just want to think about uh, as you bring yourself to, to production. Um, there's another thing there uh, with a load of links uh, for, I guess, sort of beyond the sort of initial what is ZOS Connect. So we've got um, a red paper there on sort of, uh, you know, just general architectural considerations for um hybrid cloud integration uh, there's the quick start scenarios and then a bit deeper the getting started guide um, from our washington system center and then we've got things like performance reports the deployment planning guide i just mentioned and our security documentation um, so a bunch of stuff there which is hopefully useful um, i'm going to move on really quickly now to a few examples so as i said it's been an exciting few years we've been involved with everything from Apple Pay to Alexa to connected cars, smart meters, all sorts of stuff. Um, it's been very, very exciting. Um, so I just wanted to share a few things on some examples to give you a sense of what we can do and you know how you know how we can do it. I guess you know proof points. If you're looking for those things to say to people to say, well, you know, don't worry, it managed to do this somewhere. Um, you know, quite often you need to convince your managers or your business leaders um, that it can, can do the job. So here's some examples. So first up, um, scale. People of, of, often say, how, how big can you go? Well, I don't think we found a limit yet, but we do have one large US bank does uh, upwards of 150 million API requests a day um, through ZOS Connect. So certainly that is uh, bigger than most API um management platforms on the cloud they're sort of tariffs of like how many requests you can do per month uh that goes far beyond <laughs> the, the top level i think the biggest one i've seen was google at uh 12 billion requests a year or something was their top tariff and that that would um this would certainly blow this uh, out, out of the water so um you know we we can scale to mainframe level workloads um so really really good story there um, second one is speed, um, really good story at a European bank. Um, so they were creating API requests manually. So they were hand coding them in uh, kind of Java and they've sort of putting a Java layer in. Um, they bought in ZOS Connect and they reduced that time to create an API from about three months of development time elapsed to less than a day and actually the great thing was we went in the in the morning showed the developers how to use the tool by the afternoon developers were like okay i've created two two new apis um obviously a bit of time then to work out how they were going to get to production but in terms of development time uh, it is very very fast the tooling is very intuitive um time to value uh we had an australian bank who had a challenge to sort of digitally transform their core banking framework uh, the quote we got from them was, we managed to do this in half the time and a fraction of the cost of the other approaches we were looking at. Um, return investment. So sometimes people often look at ZOS Connect and say, well, how do I justify the cost? And they get very bogged down in um, 
talking about, oh, can I save, you know, connectivity by, you know, costs on the CPU by zip offload? And it's like, yeah, you absolutely can. You know, can I save on development costs of doing? Yeah, okay, you know, that's good. But actually, it's the the business value of APIs to your enterprise. So typically, if you're doing an API project, you're doing it for a business reason. Uh, and it's a really good example here. If they took, um, it's a company who sort of digitized their um, savings account creation process. So it used to be something that fill out forms in the post. Um, so it'd take like three days to less than a second, click of a button online self-service. So within the first three months, they got 5,000 new accounts with over $150 million of deposits. So massively outweighs the cost of bringing a few Zellers Connect licenses in. So if you think about return investment in that form, um, it, it makes the product kind of no brainer. Um, expanding at what your Z applications can do. So we got a really nice story from a Spanish insurance company. They wanted to call out to a um, government hosted API to do vehicle lookup based on registration. So instead of saying, tell me everything about your car, the make, the model, the color, you know, where, where it's registered, where it's parked, all that kind of stuff. They just wanted to change their quotation process to give us a reg number. We'll give you a, um, we'll give you a, a uh, well, well, we'll give you a quote. And so they wanted to take that reg number, look up with the government API and, and come back. But their quotation application is in Kix, it's in COBOL. And so they use ZOS Connect to do that call out to that API. Um, and they actually got 30% 30 increase in conversions on their website because sort of less friction, less stuff for people to fill in. Um, so increase of business there. And finally, simplification. Um, so, so one UK bank was looking at doing PSD2 APIs um, and a lot of the integration they have between their PSD2 API front end and the back end was sort of all done in different ways and different methods. Um, so they, through using Zellers Connect, they're able to remove, and this was their quote, about 60% of the time, effort and money um, and you know complexity uh, in the way that that integration was, was happening. Um, Final thing, uh, something that's quite uh, sort of, we've all kind of lived through, I guess, this year. It's been an interesting year. Um, but story from this year was we had a customer who, um, uh, they financial organization who provide uh, loans for people who buy cars. So generally, you know, it's a good thing, help you buy a car and, um, uh, and, but, you know, obviously sometimes people say, oh, I can't quite make my finance payment this month, kind of have an extension or, or something like that. So they had a process in place. You had to call someone up, manual process. They got about, you know, millions of customers, but they got less than 10,000 of these a month normally. So, you know, no real need to change the way that works. Um, but as soon as pandemic hit and the world starts going into lockdown and people have financial difficulties, that went from less than 10,000 a month to over 19,000 people a day trying to contact them saying, um, we need, uh, you know, I want extension on my payments or I'm not going to be able to make my payments. Is that okay? And um, so what they managed to do, so they kind of had a crisis meeting on a, on a Monday and just said, okay, what are we going to do about this? Well, idea was to build a, you know, a web portal so you could go in and you could self-serve an extension request, but this requires go into the mainframe to look up, you know, what, what finance deal they have, uh, you know, what, what we would find acceptable from a risk perspective, you know, and register that they've now got this, this extension. Now they already had ZOS Connect in, in place. I don't want to by any means say we managed to implement ZOS Connect at once. They already had it. The point was they were able to create the APIs they needed within a day or two. It gave the web team you know, three, four days to create the website. And by the next week, they had a website live and they were able to service um, those kind of 19,000 um, requests that we're getting every day, uh, which is really good because it's just giving everyone peace of mind of like, yep, it's fine. You know, we understand what's going on. Uh, we'll give you a break on it. And, you know, thank you for being a customer. So really, really good story there. Uh, also have a public reference from uh, BMPP which is really nice, the quote there from their head of mainframes um, division, 
uh, the more we can expose applications and business logic from uh, running on IBM Z, the more value we can give to our business and clients. Uh, there's a whole story for that uh, on our IBM website. And finally, uh, if you don't want to take my word for it, uh, there's a bunch of links here to uh, what well, the city one is just a short video, but the other three are webinars that, yeah, okay, you've got to do the registration and the sign up. Um, but really good stories from uh, Colroy, Allstate and USAA um, talking about what they're doing with, um, with, with ZOS Connect. Uh, thank you. For, oh, final thing. <laughs> Our LinkedIn group has over 200 users. Um, if you want to talk to them, they're actually quite happy to share what they're doing and the way they're done things. So if you've got questions, it's a good place to post. There's more resources there, but that's it. And I'm just about on time. I'm really sorry, Rob. That was about a minute over or something. But Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll do better next time. Does anyone have any questions? That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but download the slides. There's a bunch of information, a bunch of links there. I hope it was useful. And um, uh, yeah, do rate the session, QR codes there. Um, any feedback um, would be welcome. Still learning how to do these remote ones and make them engaging. So thanks very much for your time. And uh, any questions, I'll hand back to Rob. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Tony. Um, a very good insight for me. Um, and very much as NOS Connect centric view of that and and um, i think the jury's still out as to whether as kicks people we'd be at the heart of all these decisions that are made for zos connect um or whether we're just one of the subsystems that that connects to this this product that's um sitting there in its own right now but i i think we've all seen the story about interfaces certainly from my point of view um We'll talk about tomorrow but kicks web services was a big success story um and came along in a similar way it's a new way for us to communicate and deliver business change and yeah. to enable our you know our historic enterprise applications to support the business quickly mm -hmm. and if we speak a language the developers understand things happen faster yeah so there's a very interesting point you you make about you know kicks people versus Cerberus connect people and um, it's often an interesting thing of, well, what team does it fall with? And you see some companies that sort of spin up a whole new set of connect team, um, which is interesting to see. But often it sort of falls with the mainframe team that sort of have the center of gravity on the platform. So if it's a really big DB2 shop, they'll be like, it goes to the DB2 team. If it's a big IMS shop, it goes to the IMS team. If it's a big Kicks shop, it goes to the Kicks team. And it's sort of, at least initially, until it gets really rolling, it, it tends to be their responsibility. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it probably depends who, who the first service is or who the big service is. Yes. Um, yeah. are. From, from my point of view, there's, there's quite a few skills to learn, mm. even the terminology around swagger and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but if it's an enterprise level API, you need enterprise skills to support it. Yeah. Um, and certainly the Kicks team have got that in spades. So yeah. there's a lot of a lot of synergy there. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we've overrun. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions. So um, thank you very much for your insights, your latest insights into ZOS Connect, uh, and thank you for everybody for attending. And um, I'll see you all again soon. Uh, next session's at twelve. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.